Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of themindrenewed.com and just before we go to the interview with Kevin Ryan on his book Another 19, I wanted to say that I'm not planning to have a podcast next week. Next week is half term for me here and it is my intention this time to have a complete break. So I'm not planning to have a guest episode or though I might change my mind if I find something that I think is really very suitable, but it is my plan, really, to have a complete break, although I will be adding a few things, of course, to the website throughout the week. But we should be back in the last week of February, when hopefully I'll be speaking with William Engdahl on his book Seeds of Destruction, The Hidden Agenda of Genetic Manipulation. Although, because of his schedule, I can't be absolutely certain that it's going to take place that week, but I'm hoping that that arrangement will be possible to be kept. Other than that, please don't forget, if you do use iTunes and uh, you're enjoying the podcast, then uh, please do give it a rating. We could always do with some more. And I wish you a great week for next week, and look forward to speaking to you in the week thereafter. So, without further ado, our interview with Kevin Ryan. Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of themindrenewed.com, podcasting to you from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. Today is the 13th of February 2014, and it is my great pleasure to be speaking to Kevin Ryan, who is perhaps one of the most widely respected and rigorous of 9-11 researchers. And in 2004, he was fired from his position as site manager for the Environmental Testing Division of Underwriters Laboratories, for asking questions about that company's testing of the World Trade Center construction materials, as well as that company's involvement in the WTC investigation being conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And since being fired for asking questions, he has uh, held prominent positions with many scholarly 9-11 research groups, co-authored several books and many peer-reviewed scientific articles on the subject. And he continues to give many presentations and interviews, of which this is one. So, Kevin, thank you very much indeed for joining us, especially at this very early hour for you over there. Well, you're welcome, Julian. Thank you for having me. Now, the subject of our conversation today is going to be your book, which you published last year, called Another 19, Investigating Legitimate 9-11 Suspects, in which you investigate, and I have to say it's very much an evidence-based investigation, you investigate an alternative 19 suspects for the crime of 9-11, that is, alternative to the alleged 19 Muslim terrorists of the official narrative. And you identify suspects who you say had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to have contributed in various ways to the 9-11 crime. And obviously, I've got a huge number of questions that I I want to ask you about this, but uh, there's only so much we'll be able to do. It's meticulously researched, very detailed book, and I highly recommend anybody who's interested, seriously interested in the subject of 9-11 should get this book and read it. But as I say, it's, it's vastly detailed, so we'll only be able to look at a fraction of the evidence. I would, however, like to start by asking you to explain a little bit about your background, because although many people will be familiar with you, I suspect some will not. So could you tell us about how you got interested in the subject of 9-11 and what happened to you at Underwriters Laboratories? Yes, I uh, began to investigate the events of 9-11 as a result of learning through uh, reading international press, actually, that the uh, Iraq war was built on a concerted effort of lies by people within my own government. And Mm -hmm. um, uh, we won't go into that, but uh, knowing that that was occurring, that people in our government would lie to start a war that frankly has resulted in far more death and destruction than uh, the events of 9-11, I began to ask when that line might have started. And that reminded me that I had been given information by the chief executive officer of my company, UL, that the company had certified the steel components used to build the World Trade Center buildings, the towers in in this case, uh, 40 years earlier. They had actually done what's called fire resistance testing. And the company, what it does is safety-related testing of all kinds. So I was the environmental division manager, but I was in touch with the CEO and the leader of the, at the time, the, the man who was the leader of the fire resistance testing division and got information from them. And uh, in a nutshell, the information that I received from them was in contradiction 
to the uh, findings of the National Institute of Standards and Technology that was investigating the World Trade Center destruction with help from my company. And when I uh, couldn't get satisfactory answers, and I was pretty sure that there was some serious contradictions between the test results that they were finding in the investigation and the summary, the, the findings of the report, I wrote directly to NIST. And in doing so, I copied to people who were at the time leaders within our country in the States of the investigation, the independent investigators, one of them being Catherine Austin Fitz and another being David Ray Griffin. From there, David Ray Griffin asked if I could, if my uh, letter to NIST could be distributed widely. And, and I agreed to that. And that resulted in ultimately my being fired by UL in the uh, you know, since then, I've done, as you said, a lot of different things uh, in order to try to get to the truth. Because once they fired me, I was very clear that something was wrong. So something was seriously wrong with the official account. And I've learned over time that that certainly is true, mm-hmm. far more than just with regard to the you know, World Trade Center buildings, but with regard to the national air defenses and and with regard to the chain of command failure in the United States on that day. Uh, uh, many other issues like 9-11 insider trading mm. just are glaring opportunities for people to learn the truth because at this point we did not have the entire truth. Absolutely. And indeed, you bring a, a lot of that research that you've been doing over the last few years into this book. And so turning to your book, you begin by looking at two key people who uh, everybody else that you discuss in your book seems to have been connected to in one way or another. And they are Vice President at the time, Dick Cheney, and Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, who you refer to as Dick and Don. And uh, you present them in some way as equivalence in this alternative investigation to uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Osama bin Laden. So could you start by telling us why you characterize Rumsfeld and Cheney that way and um, some of the main reasons why you believe they should be investigated as prime suspects? Yes, uh, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld were in perfect position in terms of being in the in control of the power centers of the United States on that day. And I say that because although Dick was only the vice president, he was in charge at the White House because the president, George W. Bush, was traveling. Uh, He was traveling in Florida initially, but then he began uh, making a circuitous route, uh, essentially fleeing, uh, in so many words. He was fleeing from the uh, crisis across the country in Air Force One. Now, it it seems uh, in retrospect, uh, Dick Cheney has basically come out last year and and told us that he told the president to stay away from Washington. Uh, In so many words, he has told us that he was in charge on 9-11. So at the White House, it was Dick Cheney. And at the Pentagon, the other um, primary location of power in the United States, where the so-called Defense Department uh, resides, uh, Donald Rumsfeld was the Secretary of Defense, and he was the man in charge there. So One reason is that the two of them were in perfect position. They were in control of the what should have been the responsive center in the United States. Another reason is that both of them were behind other deceptions. They were both actually the leaders of the coordinated series of of lies to start the Iraq war. And they were also behind, uh, Dick Cheney in particular was behind uh, deception that started the first Gulf War. And they have been involved over time in various deep state sorts of uh, events and programs. And we can talk about one called Continuity of Government, which basically was a, uh, a program started in the Reagan administration that intended to replace the U.S. government with private citizens like Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, whether they were in government or not, in uh, secret places around the United States in the, in the event of a, at that time, a nuclear strike from the Soviet Union. But that continuity of government program was revised in 1998 to have it be in response to a major terrorist event exactly like that which happened on 9-11. So Dick and Don were integral to this continuity of government program. Uh, what and did, did that kick into place, actually, it on 9-11? It did. Another person who was part of that small group of secretive 
people was uh, Richard Clark, who uh, Richard Clark was the counterterrorism expert, the lead counterterrorism expert for several administrations. And on 9-11, he implemented the continuity of government program for the first time ever. So, so those are some of the reasons, uh, and it's hard to explain in a very short period of time, but, sure. but those are some of the reasons that Dick and Don are considered uh, leading characters in this story. Yes, indeed. Yes, there's an awful lot to go into. One other thing I'd like to ask you to comment on is the fact that you, you say that uh, Rumsfeld was a founding member of the Project for the New American Century. Um, not everybody's going to be familiar with that. Could you tell us why that's important? Yes, the Project for a New American Century was a think tank, so a private think tank group of people who tried to influence policy actually over a period of time, but uh, in particular in the years leading up to 9-11, it was a group that consisted of Donald Rumsfeld and Paul Wolfowitz, his, his deputy on 9-11, and uh, various other characters who were actually strongly connected to the Pentagon and to uh, the military-industrial complex. And they had recommended to President Clinton that President Clinton begin a uh, new policy of preemptive warfare in order to get ahead of what they saw was uh, the evolution of geopolitical events. Basically, they stated to President Clinton that the revolution in military affairs that was critical, in their view, to the success of continued power of the United States was dependent on the occurrence of something they called a catastrophic or catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. And so they published this document, sent it to President Clinton, calling essentially for a new Pearl Harbor in order to affect what they called a revolution in military affairs. All of this actually did occur on 9-11, shortly within two or three years after that document was put out, uh, just a few years. And so that's why people are very interested in the Project for a New American Century, because it includes many of these people that were behind the response to 9-11, Dick and Don and Wolfowitz and Richard Armitage, who was the Deputy Secretary of State on 9-11, again, another suspect in this book. So PNAC, as it's called, is of great interest to many people. Yeah, and I was going to say that, of course, that's the reason why David Ray Griffin, of course, called his book The New Pearl Harbor. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, you talk about a private network of intelligence operatives forming during the time of the Nixon and Ford administrations. And you say that this is often referred to as the CIA within the CIA, and that Dick and Don were very likely connected to this as well. Yes, the private network was uh, something that was exposed by other researchers in the last couple of decades. The private network uh, or deep state network of a CIA within the CIA was a response to several things, one of them being the revelation of what was called the family jewels by a reporter Seymour Hersh in uh, 1974 when Dick and Don were basically running the White House for President Ford. And Dick and Don were integral to the response of the White House to these, the, the, if people don't know, the family jewels uh, were uh, a term used uh, to describe crimes by the CIA, assassination of leaders around the world, spying on Americans, God forbid, hmm. various things like that, that uh, came out and really shocked people in the States back in the 70s. They would not frankly shock people today, but at the time they did. And Dick and Don were part of, as running the White House and the Department of Defense back then in the Ford administration, they responded what was the congressional investigations into these crimes. As that occurred, and then through the Carter administration, um, the CIA became very highly focused upon within the public arena. What was the CIA doing? People were asking, and how could we control it? So laws were put into a place, the Bolin Amendment, for example, that restricted the activities of the CIA. So they couldn't assassinate people. They couldn't you know, imprison people without trial and so forth. So uh, what happened is this group of people that were being kind of run out of the CIA, including Ted Chackley, who was the deputy director of the CIA operations uh, group, uh, formed a private CIA with 
the help of foreign governments, they actually were able to uh, work with the Saudi Arabian government, French government, and others, Egyptian government, and form this kind of partnership in which um, they would serve as proxies to uh, engage in these kinds of deep state operations, off-the-book operations, that the CIA was not allowed to formally engage in. Mm. Could I ask you about two other people who you investigate, Louis Free at the FBI and George Tenet at the CIA? Now, I understand that Louis Free was director from 93 to 2001 of the FBI and George Tenet was director of the Central Intelligence from 97 to 2004. And you said that these men headed up these agencies that on the one hand, these agencies talked up the threat of terrorism to the US. And yet, on the other hand, they seemed time and time again to fail to respond to the threats and the leads on terrorism. And uh, that in your view, you say in the book that this suggests that some of those failures in inverted commas were in fact intentional. Could you tell us a bit about Louis Free and George Tenet? What, what troubles you about these guys? Well, starting with Louis Free, as you said, was the director of the FBI uh, from uh, 1993 until June of 2001. He was in charge of investigating the terrorist events of any consequence in the United States and also outside of the United States for that entire time. And that included events like the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, which uh, in some areas looks to be that there might have been involvement of, F of the FBI in that. For example, the deputy director, uh, Freeze deputy director for a short time, Larry Potts, was said by one of the suspects to have been helping the operation. So also the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center has some, there's reason to believe that perhaps the FBI was allowing such things to, to occur because an informant uh, since that time has said that the FBI knew that there was a bomb operation, had uh, intended to replace the bomb with harmless devices, and yet uh, did not do so. But over time, I think what's important that, uh, to remember about Louis Free and also George Tenet is that they did not respond to threats of terrorism in the way that one would think as that being their primary goal to protect the states from terrorism. They did not follow up on uh, serious lines of inquiry. For example, uh, you know, the FBI did not follow up on uh, the hints that Zacharias Moussaoui might have been wanting to fly a plane into uh, major landmarks and FBI agents tried to look into his uh, belongings, his laptop and so forth, and they were rejected. And the people that rejected those requests were put in place by Louis Free and reported to Louis Free up until the point where he left right before 9-11. You know, furthermore, there are operatives like Muhammad Ali, or I'm sorry, Ali Muhammad, that's a common <laughs> mistake. <laughs> You'll remember it this way. Ali Muhammad is the opposite of Muhammad Ali. Ali Muhammad was an FBI informant. He was a CIA uh, employee. Over a period of, of many years, he was a trainer, a lead trainer for Al-Qaeda. And, uh, you know, he was uh, apparently captured and allowed to plea bargain. For all we know today, he is still in custody or has been released and, and, and has not been, in any case, prosecuted. So uh, this is another FBI, I guess failure is not quite the right word. Mm. You know, this man who trained al-Qaeda operatives to hijack planes and was not only a CIA employee and FBI informant, but also a special forces sergeant in the U.S. Army. This is a big clue that maybe there's something more going on with 9-11 and other al-Qaeda events than is stated. Yeah. You also talk about things being covered up by the FBI when uh, there seems to be no reason to cover those things up, like uh, video footage at the Pentagon and things like that. Absolutely. The FBI really took control of all the evidence with regard to 9-11. Uh, at the Pentagon, as you said, there were, uh, there's said to have been over 80 security videos that uh, should have captured some portion of the impact of Flight 77 to the Pentagon, yet uh, within minutes or uh, shortly within hours after the events, all of those videos were confiscated by the FBI and have not been released. Another example is the uh, scene of Flight 93's 
alleged crash in Pennsylvania. Now, the debris pattern and other witness testimony suggests that Flight 93 might have actually been shot down. That is interesting given that the official account is that passengers had some success trying to take the plane back over after being hijacked. So that's an interesting story. But what we know is that the FBI cordoned off the entire area and also told witnesses their input was not wanted. For example, a lady who said that she she saw a military jet described in fairly good detail. The FBI told her her testimony was not wanted. You know, typically when there's a crash like this, we have a group called the National Transportation Safety Board, which pulls together all the parts from a plane, rebuilds the entire plane. Uh, You've probably seen photographs of this. And that's how the investigation is done in a very thorough manner. That's not what happened for any of the plane crashes on 9-11. And and Flight 93's incident would have been the perfect opportunity to do that. Instead, the FBI took over and all evidence and reporting was suppressed. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And turning to uh, George Tenet, uh, one of the things that really struck me in many things that you say about it is that uh, Michael Scheuer, who was uh, the head of the bin Laden unit, had said that there were several, I think it was up to 10 opportunities for the capture or uh, apprehension of uh, Osama bin Laden. And um, this was in 1998, 99. Is that right? But uh, George Tenet just didn't follow up on any of those. That's right. Michael Scheuer uh, was the head of what was called Alex Station, which was the uh, division that was focused on Osama bin Laden in particular. And uh, as Scheuer said, there were 10 opportunities to capture or kill bin Laden that were squashed, particularly by George Tenet and his the people that reported to him. So Scheuer uh, has great skepticism about Tenant and his involvement in preventing terrorism. But I think many of us, if we just look at the record, would have the same skepticism. I mean, uh, in 1998, Alex Station was shut down. It was, you know, basically there was an order to shut down this Osama bin Laden investigating unit just shortly before 9-11. And this was after several of what were called fatwas were issued by uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, allegedly, of course. Uh, These were calls for a holy jihad against the United States, public calls. And so why the the station that was focused on Osama bin Laden would be shut down made no sense whatsoever. And, of course, those sorts of orders would have had to come from the top. There are other indications that some of the alleged hijackers were being tracked by the CIA, in in particular uh, Nawaf al-Hazmi, and Khalid Al-Madar, who were the two that were coming from uh, Malaysia and Bangkok and came to Los Angeles and were uh, essentially taken care of by an FBI uh, informant and a former FBI suspect and lived with uh, the informant, uh, the FBI informant, who was also suspected of being a Saudi intelligence agent. So the CIA was tracking these people, as has been said by many people, and including Richard Clark. So it just makes no sense that they would not be captured before the events of 9-11, given that they were tracked for a period of time and they were living in the United States with an FBI informant. Some of the other things with regard to free intended is both of these men were obstructive with regard to the official investigations. Um, The FBI would not allow the FBI informant that those two alleged hijackers that uh, were living with would not allow the 9-11 commission to interview this FBI informant that it's unbelievable. This man that uh, sponsored two of the alleged hijackers and lived in the same complex with them, uh, supported them, could not be interviewed by the 9-11 commission. George Tenet uh, would not uh, be interviewed himself. He would not interview with the 9-11 Commission. And this was all allowed over time. It's really quite incredible. Mm. But, you know, given other things like both of these men joined the board a few years after 9-11 of a company called Visage, which had been one of the few companies flagged by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, for 9-11 insider trading and never investigated. So both Louis Free and George Tenet George joined the board of this company that was suspected of 9-11 insider trading. There are just many, many reasons to look at these men and say, shouldn't we really take a close 
examination of their potential part in either allowing, facilitating, or just through negligence, making 9-11 happen exactly the way it did. Absolutely, indeed. And uh, you've just been talking about uh, Richard Clark, and I wanted to ask you specifically about the interview that he gave in 2009 about the uh, Al Hazmi and Al Midar and, and all that business. I'll come on to that in a moment. Could you um, tell us about Richard Clark, who was the counterterrorism czar, and his close connection with the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, and also his very close ties with the United Arab Emirates, which you say is something that really should be looked at, but is very much just ignored in the official investigations. Yes. So the Bank of Credit and Commerce International is, for short, is called BCCI. And people may remember that this was a bank fraud story from the early 1990s. It had actually been a bank started in Pakistan in uh, the early 70s. And uh, it was later learned that it was controlled through its a subsidiary, the first American bank in Washington, D.C., which was controlled by the CIA. So, um, you know, the BCCI institution was a network of financial centers located across the world, uh, around the world, and third world countries in particular, Arab countries. Uh, so it was started by people in Pakistan and also through funding by the United Arab Emirates, which you've mentioned And UAE actually took it over. The royal family of the UAE took it over after the Bank of England shut it down in 1991, 92. And so basically, this is a terrorist financing network. That's the common understanding of BCCI. It was not just a big fraud. It was not just a CIA-controlled operation, but it was a means of financing terrorism around the world. And given that it was allegedly dissolved in 1992, but yet that all of the assets were transferred to the United Arab Emirates. It's interesting that the American who is most closely representative of the United Arab Emirates is the man who was whose job was to protect us from terrorism, uh, Richard Clark, uh, is yeah. just is startling to me yeah. that, that people wouldn't just jump on this and say, isn't that a major conflict of interest? Uh, yeah, and there's some other things that you say in the book are also, they really just jump out at you as, why on earth have these not been looked into? Because you say that Clark's relationship with the royal family of the UAE uh, continued and it, it developed, to, you say it blossomed after members of that royal family had visited Osama bin Laden and after Osama bin Laden had made his holy war statements against the US. Is that right? That's exactly right. And Richard Clark made trips to visit the royal family of the UAE and served basically as a representative of that royal family. And so some of the more startling facts about the relationship between Clark and the Emirates is that Clark was behind two of the uh, most prominent failures of the United States to capture or kill Osama bin Laden in 1999. And that was basically a matter of uh, the first one was where Clark voted down a CIA plan, which everyone else in the leadership thought was going to be effective. The second one was where Clark actually tipped off the UAE royal family that were meeting with Osama bin Laden in 1999 about the CIA plans to try to capture bin Laden. So he basically in our country, that would be considered treason. And I'm basing this on Clark's own briefing to Congress, where Congressman Richard Burr asked Clark these very specific questions, uh, basically saying, uh, Mr. Clark, did you not understand that this CIA plan was perfect for the purpose of capturing bin Laden? And did you not then leak, uh, reveal this plan? to bin Laden's comrades in the United Arab Emirates royal family, your own, basically your own partners as well, which prevented, which stopped them from going on these hunting trips in this specific area and prevented the capture of bin Laden just two years before 9-11. And uh, Clark essentially admitted in his briefing in so many words that, that the only thing false about that was that the information was not real time. 
then therefore really either not answering the question or admitting that he did in fact tip off the friends of bin Laden. So this, these things are just, they're amazing to me that they weren't followed up. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is the place where, according to the official account, what little financing was behind 9-11 came from the United Arab Emirates. All of the hijackers, other than the two I mentioned earlier and Mohammed Atta, traveled to the United States through the United Arab Emirates. And yet the United Arab Emirates is hardly ever uh, mentioned with regard to the unanswered questions of 9-11. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, turning back to that question about Al-Hazmi and Al-Midai, I mean, Clark seemed to be trying to come over as all sweetness and light when he gave that 2009 alternative media interview, which I mean, in itself, it's, I think, was an extraordinary thing to happen and is a rather suspicious fact that he was giving that interview at all. And I mean, he was claiming that the CIA knew of these individuals in the US, but that he was kept out of the loop on this. But you, you really don't buy that explanation, do you? I do not, and and I suspect, although certainly could not prove, that it is in Clark's benefit uh, to redirect attention as much as possible to the the few hijackers that were not strongly related to the United Arab Emirates. Mm. The two, Al-Hazmi and Al-Madar, and uh, their story is very interesting, certainly, particularly given that uh, they lived with an FBI informant. That's something that Clark doesn't emphasize as as he should, but those are the two that traveled from Malaysia. With instead of focusing on the two that were Emirates citizens or the people that came traveled through the United Arab Emirates, his which you know, frankly, Richard Clark could have gotten a good deal of information about Al Qaeda just by asking his friends in the UAE, which were who were big supporters of the of Al Qaeda and the Taliban. So I think he has a an vested interest in redirecting the story toward these two in, instead of yeah. focusing on his friends in the in the UAE. Yeah. Well, well, as we're short of time, I need to move on to a couple of other things here. Um, two other major subjects of investigation in your book, and of course you have many individuals associated with these subjects. This is the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, and NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. And you highlight questions surrounding the role of hijack coordinator at the FAA and with respect to NORAD, the whole series of lies that came out of NORAD, and also the suspicious fact that NORAD was conducting all these unusual uh, military exercises at the time of 9-11. So could you briefly sketch for us your reasons why you feel it's so essential to question this FAA and NORAD whole set of confusions that was going on? Well, yes, because um, one of the major unanswered questions of 9-11 has been since the day, how did our nation's air defenses fail so completely for that period of time uh, from uh, 8 o'clock in the morning on September 11th until after 10 o'clock in the morning? So for a period of two hours, despite historical evidence that our air defenses would intercept any air and aircraft within just a few minutes, on that morning for two hours, there was complete lack of air defense. You know, to complicate that matter, There have been four distinct official uh, responses to how that happened. And one of them was was given by General Richard Myers in the days after 9-11. And he said that uh, no planes, no interceptor jets were scrambled. Uh, That story changed uh, a week later to, uh, yes, interceptor jets were scrambled, but they were traveling too slowly to uh, intercept the planes. And that was changed again later Uh, given very specific timelines to when uh, the military was notified, when jets were were launched, and how they were not only traveling too slowly, but they were traveling in the wrong direction in some cases. And so the final account was given by the 9-11 Commission report, which uh, essentially says that the military was never notified. Forget all of those things we said for a couple of years. Forget all of the testimony of all of the of the Air Force military officers, the Air, so- Air Force officers who gave very detailed testimony of when they were notified and when they launched planes. Uh, that was not true. 
Um, That's extraordinary. And didn't you say that uh, Ralph Eberhardt, at least you implied that he'd said that, um, that the story should be sort of massaged to fit what it was supposed to say? Yes. Uh, when when these documents started being released, uh, some of the 9-11 Commission documents have been released, only about a third of them, I believe. They're found at the National Archives, so people need to go down and scan them in and make them available to everybody. Luckily, some people have done that. And we've been able to discover more. For example, the testimony to the 9-11 Commission of General Eberhardt. Uh, General Eberhardt was in charge of NORAD on 9-11. He was a direct subordinate of Donald Rumsfeld that day. And uh, one of his responses to all these changing stories was that, yes, I just told my staff to adjust the story as problems came up to make sure there was no more problem. Uh, Wow. In so many words. And that's just... It's amazing. But uh, as you said, there were military exercises going on that mimicked the events of 9-11 that confused the responders, that the work center responders at NORAD uh, were confused by reports of hijackings that did not actually occur. And this is a matter of record. You're not just uh, assuming that it it must have done so, but there there is. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, if you look at the uh, there's an exercise in particular called Vigilant Guardian, which was going on that very morning. It was to start almost at the exact same time uh, in the same area talking about hijacked planes. And uh, and in these records that have been released, it's clear these people say we were confused we were even joking about it. We thought, you know, the the exercise had started too early and boy, they've really done a good job this time of uh, making it realistic and so forth. Uh, it did definitely affect yeah. the response in major ways. And was this set of exercises unusual? It was, w- would it have been going on anyway throughout the rest of the year? Right. It would have been going on a couple of times a year, uh, the kinds of exercises, maybe not in that exact area, But the United States uh, air defenses are tested around the country a couple of times a year in these kinds of exercises. So on September 11th, in the same area in the northeast sector, one of these exercises was occurring at the very same time as the events of 9-11. Also, with regard to the failure of air defenses, the 9-11 Commission says that the, the major factor in the failure was the lack of communication between the FAA and NORAD. And, you know, there was one point person who is responsible for relaying, for example, requests to the military for help with hijacking. One person who's between the FAA and NORAD, and that's the position called the hijack coordinator, as you mentioned. And on 9-11, we do not know who was filling that position because the person who was supposed to be filling that position, was not asked where he was. Uh, his name was Michael Canavan, a general, U.S. Army Special Operations Commander, who had just taken the job uh, nine months before 9-11 and would just leave the job a month later. And uh, he was not asked where he was. He did respond in a hearing to another question, saying he was in Puerto Rico. His Backup was a lady named Lynn, Lynn Osmus, and she was just ha- she just happened to be sick that day, and there was no one else who filled in the hijack the critical position uh, that should have been the key to that communication that the 9/11 Commission says failed. Uh, there was no one there. We don't know to this day why that was the case or who might have been coordinating between the FAA and NORAD. There's evidence the FAA has said that the military knew about all of these hijackings in real time. There's a memo by a FAA administrator named Laura Brown that makes that very clear. But the military, through the 9-11 Commission report, is totally exonerated and claims that they were not aware of really any of these planes other than the first one, and they could not have responded, therefore. So there are a lot of unanswered questions with regard to that. The, the military exercises... Eberhardt making a strange trip at the height of the event instead of protecting the country. Donald Rumsfeld, Eberhardt's supervisor, going missing for 30 minutes at about the same time. You know, where was Dick Cheney? 
Uh, there's a lot of evidence that Dick Cheney was tracking one of the planes, but yet uh, the 9-11 Commission says he could not have been because he did not arrive at the right spot until later. This is uh, to do with Norman Mineta's uh, astonishing testimony about that day. That's right. Norman Mineta, oh. the Secretary of Transportation, has stood by his story over the years and said that Dick Cheney was having a conversation about Flight 77 as it was approaching uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, and that there were some sort of orders which Dick Cheney was maintaining at that time about that aircraft. But, of course, that's in direct contradiction to the official account because the 9-11 Commission says no one knew anything about Flight 77 until it impacted the Pentagon. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about the renovation project that had been going on at the Pentagon. Kevin Barrett actually mentioned this when he came onto the program, that it was Wedge 1 of the Pentagon that had been very recently renovated. And yet that's exactly where the aircraft uh, 77 impacted. And you have quite a lot to say about this renovation project. Could you share with us why that you feel is another area that calls for investigation? Yes, I believe that the renovation project was somehow involved in the events of 9-11. And the reason being, as you said, this this project was focused on the exact area where Flight 77 was said to impact the Pentagon. And I'm, I don't mean just the wedge, because there are five wedges. It did hit the very wedge that was under construction. But the project was for the external sides, the, the walls of the building, exactly where the plane hit. Um, not you know the interior of the entire wedge, but actually the reinforcing the walls, putting in Kevlar windows, this sort of thing, essentially preparing the very spot where the plane hit for an explosion of some sort. And I hypothesize in my book that perhaps the renovation project was a means by which the building was prepared for the events of 9-11. Now, there are, there's a lot of confusion and uh, disagreement about exactly what happened at the Pentagon, as I'm sure you've heard. I hypothesize that there was a renovation project that included the placement of explosives in the building. And I hypothesize that the plane was under uh, remote control through existing technology, which I describe in detail. I even talk about where the equipment for guiding the plane might have been positioned in the building. Uh, I've mentioned that Paul Wolfowitz, uh, Donald Rumsfeld's deputy, uh, as deputy secretary of defense, was in charge of the renovation program in the last nine months of its uh, existence. I talk about the company AMEC, A-M-E-C, which uh, was run by a man, AMEC Construction was the division of this company, run by a man in, in Toronto by the name of Peter Jansen. Uh, and how AMEC Construction not only did this renovation of this exact area, but also cleaned up the Pentagon event, was giving a, a non-compete uh, a contract to clean up and rebuild that section of the building, and was also in charge of the cleanup at Ground Zero at the World Trade Center. So this company is should really be investigated, and I think that it's yet another indication that something must have been going on with regard to construction and uh, uh, removal of debris when there's such uh, an amazing and startling sort of connection between the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, the exact area where the Pentagon was hit, and the fact that Peter Jansen, who ran this company, was a longtime business associate of Donald Rumsfeld. Yes, and indeed this uh, company connection, these corporations that you go into in some detail is a major part of your investigation. And uh, there are a couple that I wanted to ask you about in particular, and uh, those are uh, Stratisec and the SAIC. Could you tell us why those two corporations or companies are so important to this investigation? Yes, Stratisec is the company that had the electronic security contract for the World Trade Center complex and therefore is suspected of having the ability to have given access to whomever might have uh, been needed to place explosives in the World Trade Center building, all three of the World Trade Center buildings, uh, but also deny access to anyone who might have been possibly revealing those kinds of operations. So Stratisec was owned by a Kuwaiti company called Coam, a foreign company, which was very unusual for a foreign company to own a security company that had contracts not only at the World Trade Center, 
But at Dulles Airport, where Flight 77 took off that day, at uh, United Airlines in the years before 9-11, it was very unusual for a foreign company to have contracts for security at, a, at such sensitive complexes or locations in the United States. And uh, given that, it's also been revealed that the president's brother, Marvin Bush, was a board member of Stratisec up until 2000, until June of 2000. He was elected to that board in the offices of Aquam and Stratisec, which were located in an interesting place with regard to past deep, deep state events. The Watergate Hotel in Washington had offices owned and leased by the Saudi Arabians and the Kuwaitis, and that's where Coam and Stratisec had their annual meetings. So again, now this circles back to the many links to the Saudi government and 9-11, and as I point out in my book, the many links between the Kuwaiti government and the contracts for security and other things. Yeah. Is it also right that uh, there were another, and I can't remember the name of the company, but there was another company upgrading the elevators in the Twin Towers around the same time? That's right. In the nine months before 9-11, there was a major elevator upgrade project, and that was given to a company called Ace Elevator. And uh, Ace Elevator uh, went bankrupt, like Stratisec did, shortly within a uh, year or two after 9-11. So these companies uh, give the impression that they are potentially front companies for uh, intelligence or, uh, you know, operatives who are conducting operations for the purpose of the deep state. Yeah, it's very important because it's often said, isn't it, that there wouldn't have been any access for people to have planted anything in these buildings. But here, according to your research, there does seem to have been an opportunity here, a significant opportunity presented by these companies. Yes, absolutely. The elevator project, the uh, fireproofing upgrade project that was going on that exposed the, all the steel structure and the exact areas of impact in the towers, all of these were opportunities for explosives to have been placed. And the links to the Bush family and to foreign governments that benefited with regard to Stratisec are very compelling. Now, you mentioned Science Applications International Corporation. Yes. SAIC is called for short. And this is a company that had amazing numbers of connections to 9-11, they had done an assessment of the World Trade Center security before the 1993 bombing and essentially mapped out what happened in the basement explosion in, in 1993. And then they were hired to give the official account for what happened, do the investigation of the 1993 bombing. They were hired after uh, 9-11 to, they were the company that gave the largest number of investigators outside of the government to the NIST investigation. They were a company that provided explosive detection equipment for airports around the country. Uh, they were run by a man named Dwayne Andrews, who was the protege of Dick Cheney. He had been uh, Dick Cheney's assistant secretary of defense in the first Bush administration. And he had said many times that, that Dick Cheney was his personal lifelong hero. So the many other connections I can't go into uh, in a short time, but you know, they're very revealing with, re with regard to SEIC and 9-11. Absolutely. This, like a spider's web of interconnections, is astonishing, really. And one of the things that also jumped out at me from the page was that you say that the SAIC also had, was involved in nanothermite research. And that was particularly interesting because we had uh, Dr. Niels Harrit on um, in the early days of this show saying that he believes nanothermite was actually used to bring down the towers. Yes, I wrote a paper, I think in 2008, called uh, the top 10 connections between NIST and nanothermite. And, and among those, I listed the fact that SAIC, which was a NIST investigation partner, had done research through its subsidiary applied ordinance, quite considerable research into the development of nanothermite and into the ignition of nanothermite via lasers. So that, of course, is interesting given that SAIC had uh, uh, an employee who was controlling the uh, robots which were uh, scanning and sweeping the ground zero area after 9-11 and using these robots that had been previously used for removing unexploded ordnance. Dr. Herod and I have, have worked before together uh, before on nanothermite issues. 
We are also uh, continuing to work on a topic called carbon nanotubes that has to do with these materials that are found, have been found by Mount Sinai Hospital in the lung tissue of 9-11 first responders and are also generated through the ignition of nanothermite as has been uh, proven by Dr. Herrett and a commercial laboratory. Yes, indeed. And he mentioned that uh, paper. He, he had some difficulty finding it at the time, <laughs> went away for five minutes and found it and brought it back to the table and did actually discuss that. Now, uh, towards the end of your book, you consider what other more general motivations there might have been for the crime of 9-11. And uh, you say that, and I'm going to quote you here, uh, the events of 9-11 provided the pretext for implementation of pre-existing plans to seize critical resources and implement more government control over citizenry. And uh, if I may add another line which really stands out, since 9-11, the actions taken to protect the public from terrorism cannot be distinguished from actions that would be taken to protect governments and the wealthiest of their sponsors from the public. Could you explain to us your thinking here? How do you see 9-11 possibly as being essentially about resources and control? Well, the response to 9-11, as it's uh, generally termed, the response to 9-11 was to invade two countries, at least, that were strategically very important with regard to resources, one being Afghanistan, uh, which at the time uh, the United States was under, under sort of not-so-friendly negotiations with the Taliban to build a pipeline, a uh, natural gas pipeline through the country. But we have since, uh, it's since been revealed that uh, Afghanistan is the site of trillions of dollars of resources in, in the form of minerals, um, lithium, for example, and uh, other things. Uh, not only that, but Afghanistan is the primary place, the best place in the world for the production of heroin, opium, that is, uh, and the opium production, which the Taliban had had decreased significantly in their uh, tenure, went up dramatically to the point where Afghanistan became the world's leading producer of opium and heroin since the U.S. invasion. So all, those are the kinds of resources I'm talking about, fossil fuels, minerals, uh, and unfortunately, drugs, because uh, if people read the book, they see that there are uh, many connections between deep state operations and the production of illicit drugs and drug trafficking. The other country being uh, Iraq, of course, which uh, we had plans to invade. Uh, we had plans to invade Afghanistan before 9-11. And all of these things just came about uh, very conveniently. The justification then was presented by 9-11. You know, there's been discussion going back to the 90s that it's very clear that this very area of the world is critical in terms of power, in terms of control of the of the world. If you control the certain resources, you control the world. Mm. You know, Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote a book called The Grand Chessboard in 1997, Carter's National Security Advisor, and made it very clear whoever controlled this area of the world controlled the world. And so it definitely seems that 9-11 was about control and seizure of resources. Uh, yeah, in fact, I, I wanted to ask you something about this because uh, Niels Harrit, when he was on this program, described 9-11 as a coup de monde, a world coup. And I remembered that when you said 9-11 was part of a power play coordinated by powerful transnational interests, because Nils Harrett was trying to get away from the idea that this is a solely US-based thing, but this was a transnational bid for world hegemony. Do you see it that way? Yes, I do. And, and it's, I believe that's reflected in the, in, in the birth and uh, progress of the CIA within the CIA being a, uh, a mechanism by which certain countries help each other out and, you know, in off the book operations and also just in the in the very facts of uh, transnational corporations today, which, uh, you know, our governments are not acting most of the time solely in the interests of their particular citizens. And our politicians are funded definitely in the United States, by corporations. They are funded not only by corporations, but in ways that uh, we can no longer even reveal, that we, don't, we can't even find out 
where our politicians' money is coming from anymore. It's not limited as it used to be. And corporations, which are transnational by nature today, are, are therefore running government policy. So uh, it seems that 9-11 benefited many different countries, many different Western countries in particular, in regard to uh, you know the, the availability of the resources that were needed. If you look in Iraq, they're, they're not just American companies that are benefiting, but there are French and British companies benefiting. If you look at Afghanistan, the similar sorts of things, uh, German companies uh, in Africa, the same sort of thing around uh, that entire continent. It's a transnational grab for resources. And although there may be national interests involved, I really think the decision making is more about power and money at a higher level. Mm. And uh, going back to the question that I asked you before about the control over the citizenry, uh, do you see this this sort of corporate grab concentrating a lot of wealth in a few hands at the expense of ordinary people sort of gives a, a rationale for wanting to increase control over ordinary people? And of course, 9-11 really was a kind of catalyst for that to take place. Do you see that that is part of the picture as well? Oh, yes, absolutely. In the States, we are dealing, and I think around the world today, with the revelations about what the National Security Agency is doing, spying on people around the world, uh, collecting all of their information, telephonic information, internet data, everything that they can, and scooping it up and storing it. And that is all justified. If we ask the NSA why they're doing that, they come out very clearly and state, we don't want another 9-11. It, it really is about 9-11. 9-11 is the justification for uh, the capture and torture of people around the world for the Patriot Act, which was enacted without legislators reading it immediately after 9-11. So all of this control of citizenry and other abuses of, of normal human decorum uh, go back to 9-11. And uh, I think 9-11, therefore, is the key to stopping yeah. all of it. And uh, one of the main hopes, of course, with your book is that this will cause further investigation along the lines that you've opened up here. And uh, you say in the book that you believe that the U.S. itself will never allow a proper investigation into 9-11, but you do see some kind of hope coming from other countries. Now, uh, given that every attempt is going to be made, no doubt, to, by the mainstream media to discredit any such effort, do you feel that such investigations could actually be initiated? Do you think that even if they were initiated in other countries, that they would ever gain sufficient credibility to have any effect? I think they would to some extent, and I think there would certainly be great challenges in accomplishing those investigations. But the point I made in my book was that uh, the attack on the World Trade Center in particular was not an attack solely on American citizens, but citizens from 59 different countries were killed on 9-11, and therefore their, their governments have a responsibility to investigate the death of those citizens. And I think that there can be an official investigation in a country like Canada. Uh, there has been uh, the start of one in a country uh, called Malaysia, uh, or any of the other 57 countries could start their own investigation and give visibility to the questions. And a lot of the the investigation has to some degree already been done, and much more of it needs to be done and pinned down, but that will require, to some extent, subpoena power. So if the suspects are American citizens, would those countries be able to subpoena testimony under oath by American citizens? That might be difficult. But on the other hand, those people do have to travel. And as we see with Dick Cheney and George Bush, they have very restricted travel lately because they will be brought up on charges in some countries. Mm. Okay, so what's the best way for people to get hold of a copy of your book? I got hold of it through Amazon, but um, can they get it through your websites? Well, uh, they can get it through my website. It really all goes through Amazon, but there is a special site uh, at my website that is not Amazon-specific. But the best way, really, for the best price is through Amazon. Uh, so, yeah. 
and I, and I do very, as I said at the the top of the program, I do very much recommend that people read this book because there is so much in it. And of course, a lot of what you have in this book comes from your work over many years at various 9-11 uh, scholarly groups. So I'm wondering if you could also tell us how people can find those groups on the internet and the resources that are there. Yes, I have uh, been over the years a founder of certain groups, uh, the Scholars for 9-11 Truth and Justice, which can be found at stj911.org. Uh, the Bloomington 9-11 Working Group, which is our local group here in Bloomington, Indiana. And also, uh, I've been a director at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, ae911truth.org, which uh, is a very valuable site for resources and also just for the fact that 2,100 licensed and degreed architects and engineers are calling for a new investigation of the events at the World Trade Center. Yeah, and did you mention the Journal of 9-11 Studies? I did not, strangely <laughs> enough. I'm co I am co-editor of the Journal of 9-11 Studies, which is a great resource for information about 9-11, a free resource, and that is just spelled out journalof911studies.com, where uh, my co-editor, Professor Graham McQueen from Canada, and I provide the most reliable information we possibly can through peer-reviewed academic type papers yeah absolutely excellent yeah well kevin ryan thank you ever so much for coming on uh, as i say there's no way we could possibly do justice to your very very detailed book and i just hope that people will be inspired by what you said today to get it and uh, that it will generate much further research because of course it's full of leads for further investigation so as i say it's been a fascinating conversation with you thank you ever so much indeed for coming on thank you very much julian